Welcome to the Every Nation Dorado Congregation. We exist to honor God by establishing Christ-centered, spirit-empowered, and socially responsible churches and campus ministries in every nation. Here's a look at this week's announcements. Join us every Monday as we fast and pray corporately. We meet for face-to-face -face prayer between 5.30 and 7 p.m. Please note that every first Monday of the month, the men and women meet separately to pray. We start off together with worship at 5.30 p.m. Thereafter, the men go upstairs. The next meeting will be Monday, the 6th of June. From the 2nd to the 4th of June, we will be hosting our Victory Weekend. Thursday and Friday from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. and Saturday from 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Victory Weekend is a time to strengthen our spiritual foundations in God and get equipped to overcome spiritual bondages and hindrances in our walk with God. Some of the topics we will cover are identity, victory over sexual sin, victory over relational dysfunctions, addictions, generational sin patterns, and spiritual error. Registrations will close on the 29th of May. The fee is 200 Namibian dollars per person, which includes books and meals. You can sign up at our info desk or contact our office on 081-127-0611. We all have a call from God to help others follow Jesus. Join us at our next Making Disciples training coming up on Friday the 3rd of June from 6 p.m. and Saturday the 4th of June from 8.30 a.m. The cost is 50 Namibian dollars per person. Sign up today on our comms group or at the info table. Join our Discover Spiritual Family on the 4th of June at 9 a.m. Come and learn more about who we are as a church and consider membership. Please register on our comms group or sign up at the info table. If you have not been baptized in water yet, what are you waiting for? This opportunity is for you. On the 5th of June, we will be having water baptism from 1 to 2 p.m. Take note of the address on the screen and sign up on our website or at our info table at church. Please remember to bring along baptism clothes and a towel. Our Night of Encounters prayer night will be taking place on Friday the 10th of June at our Dorado Church from 6 p.m. till midnight. Come expectant to encounter the Lord in the anointing of corporate prayer. Let's look to the Lord and His strength and seek His face always. Let's reach out to our community. Join us on a Dorado neighborhood outreach taking place on Saturday the 18th of June from 9.30 a.m. to 12 p.m. All are welcome from all ages. Contact Auntie Katrina on 081-842-3166 for further details. Our intercession ministry will be hosting a prayer camp weekend from the 8th to the 10th of July at Rock Lodge. If you want to learn to pray, grow in your prayer life, or you already love prayer, this camp is for you. Teachings will be by Pastor Eric Bapatel, our Every Nation Southern Africa Prayer Director. Cost of the camp is 1,420 Namibian dollars per person, meals and accommodation included. Payments can be made to our church account using the following reference, your name underscore prayer camp. Please sign up at the information desk or contact Auntie Barbara Yacobi. Our weekend ministry is having a winter clothing and blanket drive. Please partner with them this winter with warm winter clothing from newborns up to adults. Warm socks are especially welcomed for the winter chills. You can deliver your items to the church office. Our office hours are as follows, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday to Thursday and 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. on Fridays. For further inquiries, please contact Auntie Katrina or Auntie Rita on the following numbers should you want to provide extra items on 081-842-3166 or 81 Visit our website for any additional information at ianvintuk.org. Let's commit to read, understand, believe and obey the Word of God. Enjoy the service. Hello everyone and welcome to our online broadcast. It's always a blessing to be able to come into your home or into your car, wherever you are uh, listening to us and watching with us. 
who received the word of God. I just want to remind us concerning the announcements that have gone up, especially the one on Victory Weekend and Spiritual Family. You know, these are the milestones that we have in the church in order to get you established in the things of God. And so in freedom, in spiritual family, it's really critical that you participate in that if you have not yet participated in that. And uh, this past week, we celebrated Ascension Day, such a critical and, and very exciting notion that Jesus flies. <laughs> and that's the picture that I have of Ascension Day, that in front of his disciples, after he's been resurrected and spent time with them for 40 days, he then ascends in front of their eyes. He, he goes up into the heavens. And the word of God says that he will return in the same way when the angels appeared and said, this Jesus whom you have seen living in this way will come in the, in the same manner. And so that gives us hope that we're not just serving a man. We are serving God in the flesh who ascended. And the word of God says that when he died, we died. When he was raised from the dead, we were raised from the dead. And when he ascended, we ascended together with him. And when he was seated on his throne, we were seated together with him far above powers and principalities and every name that is named. And so our position is aligned and attached to that of Christ because we are in Christ. That's how much God loved us, that he desired to put us in his son. And so... Happy Ascension Day. I hope you and your family will celebrate that and that your children will understand that there's someone greater than Superman. His name is Jesus. Awesome. Today we're continuing with our series called Key Kingdom Keys and Principles. And over the last few weeks, we've been speaking about the first week on how keys and principles work. The second week, keys in the marketplace. The third week, keys in finances. And last week we spoke about keys in handling people. And today we're completing the series with this subject of keys in fulfilling your destiny, God's will for your life. And so I'm going to pray for us and then we can get into the message. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. Our lives belong to you and uh, we are living for your glory and for your renown. We pray, Lord, even as your word goes forth that people who are sick will be healed. Those who need to be saved will be saved. We thank you that your word does not return void, but it, it, is, it is a blessing unto our lives, even medicine to all our flesh. And so, Father, may your word be a sharp sword into our hearts in order to fulfill your purpose in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So today we're talking about the keys for fulfilling your destiny and God's will for your life. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 4, the, um, this is uh, Solomon. He says, the Lord has made everything for its own purpose, even the wicked for the day of evil. And so God does nothing without having a purpose and a destiny for that thing. He is a creator. And he is not just randomly allowing things to happen. He has deliberately made the earth and created mankind for a specific purpose. And its destination is clear from the word of God. And so we might ask ourselves, what, what does it mean? What is God's destiny for my life? Destiny is different from purpose. Purpose is the reason why something was made. Destiny is the ultimate place intended for that thing. And so uh, if we look, for instance, at flies, I mean house flies, uh, I got some research. It says that flies act as scavengers consuming rotting organic matter so that we don't have to deal with it, which is a very important role in the environment. And if it wasn't for flies, there would be rubbish and dead animals carcasses everywhere. So that is the purpose of the fly. But the destiny of the fly is really to die. <laughs> Eventually, after some time, the fly dies, it fulfilled its purpose, and it ends up uh, de decomposed. But for mankind, mankind's destiny is ultimately to be conformed 
to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. That God has predestined mankind to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. But there are special purposes and special destinies for every single individual. Now, this is the first principle. God has a general purpose for you and a general destiny for you. Mark chapter 12, verse 30. It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This is everything. All your heart, all your soul, your mind, your will and emotions, all your mind and all your strength. And so God's purpose is relational. His desire is that you and I will find ourselves in relationship with God in such a tremendously fulfilling relationship that we are loving God with our everything. And ultimately, that brings us to the destination, which is to be with God forevermore in that love relationship. And then it says in verse 31, the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. So Jesus was being questioned by the teachers of the law. What is the greatest commandment? And he shared these two. And so God's desire for mankind, God's best blessed place for mankind, God's destiny for you and I is that we will find ourselves in a relationship with God because God loved us and we love God. And that we'll find ourselves in a relationship with other people whom we love and who love us. This is the perfect picture. This is the destiny. So the principle is this. That God has a general purpose. The first general purpose that God has for us and general destination is that we'll be in a relationship with God, loving God and God loving us and loving people and people loving us. Matthew chapter 28 verse 18. Then Jesus came to them. This is just before he ascends into heaven. And he said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So this is the commission that Jesus gave to his disciples and ultimately to the church was to go into, into the whole earth with the authority of Jesus Christ to make disciples, to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to teach them everything, to teach them to obey everything that Jesus has taught and commanded us. So this is the general purpose that God has for you and I. First and foremost, that we'll love God with all of our everything. We'll love people as we love ourselves. Secondly, that we will make disciples of all nations that will be involved in the baptizing of people, that will be involved in teaching them about Jesus because that is their road into a relationship with God. That is their place in loving God and loving people. Now, the first key out of the first principle, the general key that I want to share with us right now is that we ought to be faithful with a general purpose first. We're here trying to discover what is God's destiny and ultimate plan for my life and how can I fulfill that? The first thing you ought to do is be faithful in the general purpose and if you fulfill your purpose, if you fulfill the general destiny, you will reach your destiny. If you fulfill your general purpose, you will reach your ultimate destiny. And what is that general purpose that we ought to fulfill first? That we ought to know that God loved us. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed or lavished upon us that we should be called children of God. And so he makes us his children, brings us into relationship with him. And our purpose and destiny is to have a wonderful, loving relationship with God, free from sin, free from fear. And then to have that love overflow in relationship with people. And then involved in that is making disciples and baptizing people and teaching. This is not just for the preachers. It's for every believer. The second principle is this, your, your specific purpose is your responsibility. 
This is very important. So we've got the general calling, the general destiny where you are going. But then there is a specific purpose, a specific destiny for your life. This is very important because many people are a cheap imitation, a cheap copy of an original. They imitate and copy other people's purpose and destiny instead of discovering God's plan for their own life. Now, first, you have to fulfill the general one. That one, wherever you go, whether you're a doctor, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a stay-at-home mom, whether you're a plumber, whether you're a mechanic, whatever you do, whether you're a preacher, whatever you do, you need to love God with all, and then you need to uh, have God love you, and then you need to love your neighbor as yourself. That is going to be the thread across your life, regardless of your vocation. And then you need to make disciples wherever you go, preaching the gospel, sharing your testimony, uh, baptizing people, leading them to Christ and, and discipling them, teaching them the word of God. This is a joy that the Holy Spirit is bringing every believer into. But then there is a specific destiny and purpose that you will be involved with particularly. And this is very much attuned to your specific makeup your specific design. I'm telling you now, there is no one exactly like you. Even identical twins have different um, fingerprints. So even identical twins have different purposes and destinies from God. You are not a mistake. God has a specific purpose for your life. And the sooner you discover that, the sooner you'll come into a fulfillment and into an alignment with that purpose. And it doesn't mean that every purpose will have a happy ending, so to speak. But once you fulfill your destiny, once you fulfill your purpose, you will ultimately get to that place where God will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Many of the disciples ended up dying gruesome deaths, but they fulfilled their destiny. John the Baptist with his head on a platter in front of a contingency of guests because of the dancing of a young lady. And so many times the ultimate a picture at the end of our lives doesn't necessarily look uh, all, 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 all glossy and flowery. That's not what we're saying. The ultimate purpose is that we were poured out and fulfilled our purpose according to God's wisdom. And ultimately, in the next life, we'll receive that reward. So I want us to read here, specifically looking at this, the, the account of Moses. And uh, I've got so many scriptures that we're going to run through uh, in Exodus chapter 3 and 4. We'll try and just uh, uh, rush through it and highlight some of the principles and keys that Moses had to apply in order to fulfill his purpose and calling in the Lord. All right, so I'm reading here from Exodus chapter 3. Um, in the NIV, what happened here is uh, the Israelites are in bondage in Egypt for about 400 years. And uh, a young man is, is born among them from the tribe of Levi. His name is Moses. His parents hide him because the edict of the Pharaoh said all the boys under the age of two kill them because the Israelites were becoming too numerous and were intimidating the Egyptians. And so they became slaves there. But Moses... Uh, the story goes, um, you can read it uh, earlier on, his mother put him in, in uh, 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 a basket and um, uh, covered it with tar and all of that and made it float down the Nile River. And uh, it so happened to find the place where the king's daughter was bathing, the princess, and she took him up and raised him as her own son. And eventually Moses then kills someone in defending an Israelite and then escapes from Egypt ends up in Midian, in Midian, and uh, he, he, he then is tending sheep and flocks. He marries a lady there who is the daughter of the high priest in that area. And so he's tending sheep and flocks. And so uh, this is where we pick up the narrative. It says in Exodus chapter 3, verse 1, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him 
in flames of fire from within a bush. You know, many times we gloss over this. We think that it was actually God who was in the bush. But the word of God is very clear that it was the angel of the Lord. There is an angel that makes the presence of God appear. And he speaks in the first person as if it's God speaking. And so there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flames of fire from within a bush. And Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. And so Moses thought, I will go over and see the strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. And when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. Very interesting how God called to him, but it's the angel that's manifesting the presence of God. And so Moses gets this calling from the bush, from God. And then it goes on, and Moses said, here I am. This is the first key here that we need to highlight that as God is calling us, he will expect a response. Even when Samuel was being called, he kept going to Eli, the high priest, and saying, did you call me? And Eli said to him after three times, no, when, when a voice calls you, it's the Lord calling you and say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. There needs to be a response, a reply when the call of God comes into our lives. Verse 5, do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. So when we're beginning to encounter our destiny and the place where God wants us, there will have to be a response from our side in recognizing that this is not just anyone calling us. It's holy. Uh, God is transcendent. He is different from us. And so we need to respect and recognize that. And then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So God begins to share his vision and his plan and his assessment of the problem that Moses is going to solve. Verse 8. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And so God is making a promise that he wants to bring them out of, out of slavery into a destination, into a promised land. Verse 9, and now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now I am, so now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. So there's the first instruction coming from God. He, uh, Moses is having this supernatural encounter. He's not even wearing his shoes anymore. He's covering his face. He's listening to this voice coming from the bush. And the voice is saying, go and defy the largest empire on the earth at that time. And then bring out my people out of bondage and defy the Pharaoh. And, and Moses knew Egypt. He grew up in Egypt. He knew the power of the Pharaohs and God is sending him as a lone ranger to go and deliver the people. And so this is verse 11. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Very relevant question. I know Pharaoh. I know Egypt, oh God. I know how powerful they are. Who am I? I'm just a shepherd in the backyard of Midian. And I, I'm a fugitive in Egypt. Who am I that I should go and, and bring the Israelites out from the fist of, of, of Pharaoh? Verse 12. And God said, I will be with you. This is amazing. That, that God is not answering and saying, no, you are this and you are that. No. It's not about who Moses is. It's about who is sending him. It's about who is with him. It's about whose assignment he is fulfilling. And God Almighty is saying, I will be with you. And then it says, 
And this will be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. This is so strange a sign. <laughs> At the end of your assignment, once you have done everything and risked, risked everything, at the end, you'll see it worked out. Then you'll know <laughs> that I'm the one who sent you. What? God, can I have a sign before I go? And many times, you know, God is amazing how he will instruct us and posture us in a place where we have to trust him. We have to depend on his voice. And yet, God is tolerant. You'll see now. And then it says, um, you will worship God on the mountain, on this mountain, on Mount Horeb. And then, verse 13, Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? So Moses is starting now to raise the different issues concerning what he anticipates will be the problems he will face. The first one is, will the people even follow me out of Egypt? Even if I, you know, sometimes you're sent to help people and the very people you're sent to help are not responding, are not collaborating, are not going with, are not following your guidance and your advice. And so he raises this to Moses. Who will I say? Suppose I, I go to them and they say, what's his name? Verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. <laughs> Once again, you're bringing revelation that the people don't know. They've been in bondage for about three or four generations and 400 years of, of bondage and slavery. And so he has to reintroduce them to God. And God says, not Yahweh, not this. He says, I am. Anyway, we keep reading verse 15. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. Verse 16, go assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what has been done to you in Egypt, verse 17, and I have promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hevites, and Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. Look at the, the advert that the Lord is putting out. Guys, move, follow me, I'll take you to a better place. And the, uh, verse 18, the elders of Israel will listen to you. Then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. And so God is already preparing Moses. Moses has not even said yes. But God is already assuming that obviously you have to, <laughs> it's God asking you, you have to do it. And so uh, God begins to explain, this is exactly what you ought to do. Go to the leaders, tell them this, and then go to Pharaoh and then tell him it's a three-day journey. And then he will harden his heart, but I will use my strong arm to bring it out. So this is what he says in verse 20. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. After that, he will let you go. Verse 21, and I'll make the Egyptians favorably disposed towards this people so that when you leave, you will not go empty handed. Amazing. And then verse 22, this is detail that God has given Moses. It's a first encounter that he is having. He's not writing and recording anything. This is all the word of God that is going into, into him. Every woman, verse 22, is to ask her neighbor, the Israelite woman, ask her neighbor and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold. Ask the Egyptians for articles of silver and gold and for clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters, and so you will plunder the Egyptians. And this was at the point when they would leave. Now God is here explaining to Moses, he's having a supernatural encounter, receiving guidance concerning um, fulfilling this destiny, this purpose that God has for him. And so we go on to chapter 4, 
Now, this is Moses' reply. Imagine God is in your bedroom and your, your cupboard is, is, is burning, but it's not. And a voice is coming out from it and speaking to you concerning your assignment. And let's look at Moses' response. Moses answered, what if they do not believe me? The what ifs. What if, God, what if it doesn't work? God, what if, it, God, what if, what if, what if? We tend to do that a lot. It, this is God speaking. What if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? Verse 2, then the Lord said to him, what is in your hand? God will always start with where you are. Because we will always say, what if what I have is not enough? God will start with where you are. What you have right now is enough to fulfill your destiny from where you are. God might add to your skill. He might add to your experience. He might add to your people. He might add to your resources. But from where you are, you can say yes to God today. So God asked him, what is in your hand? And he says, a staff, a stick. He replied, and the Lord said, throw it on the ground. And Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake and he ran from it. And then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And so Moses reached out his hand and took, reached out and took hold of the snake and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. And then the Lord said, put your hand inside, put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand into his cloak and when he took it out, his skin was leprous. He had a rash and it became white as snow. And now put it back into your cloak, he said. And so Moses put his hand back into his cloak and when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. Verse eight. And then the Lord said, if they do not believe you or pay attention to this first sign, they may believe the second. Look at how God is really giving Moses persuasion enough. He's, he's going out of his way. God should have said, Moses, you're going, there's no option. And, but he's, he's not that. He is going out of his way to give Moses enough to assure his heart. And God does this so often. Verse 9, but if they do not believe these two signs or listen to you, Take some water from the Nile River and pour it on the ground, on the dry ground. And the water you take from the river will become blood on the ground. Verse 10. And Moses said to the Lord, look at his re reply here. Pardon your servant, Lord. I've never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. <laughs> I've never been eloquent in the past. And even now that I'm, that I'm talking to you, this last uh, 30 minutes, I haven't been eloquent here. <laughs> and then he says, I am slow of speech and tongue. Now, this is amazing that Moses will raise this because he's actually beginning to make his excuses. And many times we do the same. Oh, Lord, I'm not talented enough. Lord, I'm not gifted enough. Lord, I'm not white enough. Lord, I'm not black enough. Lord, I'm a woman. Lord, I'm a man. Lord, I'm in between. Lord, I'm this. Lord, my background is that. Lord, I, I'm too poor. Lord, I'm too rich. Lord, I'm this. I'm from that town. I'm from this city. I'm from this tribe. And we try and persuade God as if he doesn't know. And it shows how obnoxious and proud we can be. But if you take hold, I, I just made a reference here from Acts chapter 7 verse 22. This is where Stephen was about to be stoned, but he was explaining to the leaders in the early church about their history. And he speaks of Moses. He says, and Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. He was mighty in his words and deeds. Before God meets him, Stephen says that Moses used to be eloquent. And yet Moses is lying <laughs> and claiming to not be able to speak. I guess he's saying, look, I'm eloquent for normal things, but I'm not eloquent enough to persuade Pharaoh to let go of his millions of slaves. <laughs> wow, amazing. That we will go find something in our past, in our present, something in our background to say no to God. Verse 10, Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant. I've never been eloquent and, and, and uh, neither now nor since you've spoken to me. I'm slow of speech and tongue. Verse 11, then this is God's response. The Lord said to him, who makes human beings 
their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go. <laughs> so the Lord's temper is now reaching <laughs> fever pitch. <laughs> I, I know that God doesn't have a temper, but his anger is being stirred. Now go, I will help you speak and I will teach you what to say. Look at how God is going out of his way. Because God doesn't do just anything on the earth without using mankind. He does nothing except he reveal it through his prophets, through his leaders, through his people, through his servants. Verse 13, but Moses said, <laughs> pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. <laughs> there we go. Moses says all his, Lord, but what if they don't follow what I say? Lord, what if, what if they ask me your name? What if, uh, who will I say send me? Who, who, what, what if I can't speak? What if, uh, the reason why he was raising all of those what ifs was because he wanted to get to this. Please send someone else. And isn't it classic every time we've got a special purpose. Moses, you are the only Moses here. I have to use you. This is your destiny. This is your purpose. And even for us, God, please send somebody else. Look at verse 14. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses. And he said, what about your brother? Aaron the Levite. I know he can speak well. He's already on his way to meet you. And he will be glad to see you. You will speak to him. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you. And it will be as if he were your mouth and as if you were God to him. But take this stuff in your hand so you can perform the signs with it. Hallelujah. So we've come uh, to the end of the account of Moses. The principle is this. Firstly, the second principle is that your specific purpose is your responsibility. You have to respond to God. The third principle from Exodus chapter 4 is this. God doesn't like being resisted. And as we are talking about fulfilling our destiny, you must understand that you fulfill, firstly, you fulfill your general purpose, right? You got to fulfill your general purpose. Everyone has a general purpose. God has a general purpose for you. Fulfill that one first. But secondly, your specific purpose is your responsibility. Then thirdly, it's important that you understand that God doesn't like being resisted. And God's anger burned against Moses for his obnoxious responses. And then it, it is so important that we understand these three principles as we are engaging the Lord. Deuteronomy 32 verse 51 and 52. This is because both of you broke faith with me in the presence of the Israelites. This is God speaking as to why Moses never entered into the promised land. So Moses eventually goes into Egypt, miracles happen, he brings them out just like God said, and he brings them to the threshold of the promised land. The people did not believe the promise of God, and they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years until that generation died. And Moses was not able to enter because of this. This is, be uh, this is because both of you broke faith with me in the presence of the Israelites at the waters of Meribah Kadesh in the desert of Zin. And because you did not uphold my holiness among the Israelites, therefore you will not see, you will see the land only from a distance. You will not enter the land I'm giving to the people of Israel. Was that God's plan for Moses? No, Moses was supposed to enter in 40 years ago. But many times we hinder God's purpose and destiny on our lives because of our attitude and response to God. And there are consequences to that. May the fear of God come upon our lives as we are Searching our hearts to how we respond to the Lord. All right, so these are the four keys that I want to leave with you. Those are the three principles. You've got a general purpose that you need to fulfill. Your specific calling is your responsibility. And be careful how you respond to God. God doesn't like being resistant. And then fourth is these are the four principle, uh, keys for your destiny. One, be a living sacrifice. It's going to cost you. 
you're going to have to risk things to follow God and fulfill your purpose. Two, learn to obey the, the, the word and the spirit of God. Three, choose holiness. You got to live separate. You got to live differently from everyone else. You might not be able to watch everything everyone watches. Have the friends everyone has. Have the things that everyone has because of a special purpose God has for you. And number four, expect a reward. I just want to read for us two scriptures and then we will conclude. Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. It says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, dedicating all of yourself, set apart as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, which is your reasonable or rational, logical, intelligent act of worship. Verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs, but be transformed and progressively changed as you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes so that you may prove for yourselves what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan and purpose for you. So the first thing you, you ought to do, if you're going to fulfill God's destiny for your life, you've got to be a living sacrifice. Give up your life. Say, Lord, my life belongs to you. Have your way. Then you need to not adjust and adapt to the rest of the world. You've got to be someone who lives according to God's way, obey his word and his spirit. Then thirdly, live a holy life. You can't be like everyone else, living a sinful life and trying to fulfill God's will for your life. And then last scripture, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20. Timothy, the young pastor mentored by the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul writes to him and says, In a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels or cups and plates, but also those of wood and clay, some for honorable use and some for dishonorable use, some for special purpose and some for just common purpose. Verse 21, so if anyone purifies himself, not God purifies him, purifies himself from anything dishonorable. He will be a special instrument set apart, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Then he says, flee youthful passions, the, the lusts of the youth, and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with all those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. So he's saying, look, in a house, there are different kinds of vessels, different kinds of plates, cups. Some are for special purposes and some are for common purposes. The ones, you, people who want to be used for a special purpose, you got to cle clean yourself, purify yourself from things that cause dishonor in your life. Rid yourself of lust and rid yourself of malice and anger and all those things. Go before God and say, Lord, I need you to prune me, to cleanse me, to clean me. The Holy Spirit will help you and convict you and lead you in that. If you want to be used for a special purpose, you, you have to uh, purge yourself from all of those things and begin to pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call God from a pure heart. And then you, there's no way you will not be able to fulfill your destiny. In conclusion, don't waste your life. Live for God. Don't waste your life. Live for God. So these are the three principles. There's a general purpose to love God and to love people and to make disciples. You got to fulfill that wherever you go. Secondly, there's a special purpose. You are unique. God has a special purpose and destiny for your life. And so like Moses, respond well. I want to encourage you, go back to that passage. God will speak to many of you through those, those scriptures in Exodus chapter 4 and chapter 3. And then thirdly, notice that God doesn't like to be resisted. Be careful how you react and respond to the call of God on your life. Not just ministry-wise, but in any area of life. And then you've got those four keys that are important. That firstly, you've got to be a living sacrifice. Learn to obey the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Learn to do it. It's not something that always comes easily. And then thirdly, choose holiness. And fourthly, expect a reward. Well done, good and faithful servant. Awesome. So I want to pray for us. If you're out there and you don't know God, 
The first step is to get to know God, general purpose. Pray with me right now. Say, Heavenly Father, I recognize that I'm a sinner and I need your salvation. My life is useless and it's on its way to damnation. Give me a new life. I receive eternal life. I receive a new heart. I believe that Jesus died for me on the cross. And three days later, he was raised from the dead and he's alive today. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Be the Lord and master and savior of my life. I give you my heart. I receive forgiveness for all my sins and I receive eternal life in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. If you've prayed that prayer, please contact us on the details that you see on this video and we will uh, connect you in a way that you can be a disciple. For the rest of us, have a wonderful, wonderful, blessed day. Remember that God has a purpose. Don't wait. You can start saying yes to God today. What is in your hand? I see a lady, you just started a business and you are really having a lot of fear concerning the future of that thing. I am uh, uh, I'm sensing the Holy Spirit saying fast for one day, pray. The Holy Spirit will give you encouragement and you will see that business be a blessing to other people. I see two people, you've got a calling into ministry and you've been delaying it. And God is saying, now is the time. Now is the time to step into it and God will be with you like he was with Moses. Awesome. So may the Lord bless you. Um, if you're in the city, if you're in Vento, please join us in our services live. We'd love to meet you. If you're far, if you're overseas, may God continue to lead and bless you and may you continue to be a blessing wherever you are. It's wonderful to be with you. May you have a wonderful week. God bless. Thank you for listening. For more information about this podcast and other resources, please visit envintook.org.